Great. Hi. So my name is Christine Elder, and I'm a naturalist and artist and educator uh, from Bend, Oregon. <laughs> and I'm coming to you today to tell you all about sloths. So today's plan is I'm um, going to give you a slideshow of sloth biology. Um, so we're going to do our presentation and then we're going to be sketching our sloth, which I'm sure everyone is looking forward to. And then today is a free workshop. Usually I charge for my workshops, but today I would love you to um, give your funds instead to the Toucan Rescue Ranch. And we'll talk more about them in a moment. So our suggested materials are your favorite pencils. Now I'll be using um, a brown, uh, very thin pencil that I love to use in the field, but you can use anything you want. Um, and your sloth handouts. And so I've got a three page handout and don't worry if you don't have that, but you can always down that load that later on. Um, there is a link at the top of the chat box, as well as um, in the email that I sent to almost every one of you. So you should have gotten that. I think I sent it to most of you um, yesterday. And then, so that shows um, your handout that you're gonna be drawing your sloth on. We're gonna draw this one. And then I've given you a couple of extra pages um, as a bonus, some nice high resolution images that I purchased um, of two fingered and three fingered sloths. So those are our materials. But if you're not gonna, um, if you don't feel comfortable following along sketching, that's okay. You'll still learn a lot um, by attending this workshop. And you can always just watch the step-by-step -step drawing demonstration, maybe follow along later on. So no worries if you don't have any materials with you. Okay, and so I really wanna thank the Toucan Rescue Ranch. <laughs> the reason I'm talking about toucans, or not toucans today, but um, sloth is because I was lucky enough to spend some time there last month uh, as a volunteer at the Toucan Rescue Ranch, which is named after the first animals that they focused on. But as they went along since 20, um, 2004, they realized that sloths and a lot of other mammals um, need them even more. So um, I want to really thank uh, the founder and executive director, Leslie Howell, for uh, having me, hosting me there at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. And so again, today's um, workshop is a, a fundraiser. And so I hope you will uh, donate to the Toucan um, Rescue Ranch. And uh, here, of course, is their uh, website, toucanrescueranch.org, where you can learn all about what they do and all the different animals they help, not just toucans and sloths, but a lot of other things as well. Okay, and so, where was I here? Just a moment. Yeah, so the Toucan Rescue Ranch um, rescues uh, native mammals and birds um, of, the, of the tropics in Costa Rica. So they have an amazing veterinary team that I got to meet and they have all the equipment, which is very expensive to buy and maintain. So that's where your funds go. Um, and then, of course, they're raising the baby sloths. This is a Reggie, I believe, the baby um, three-fingered sloth. So it takes a lot of um, baby formula and time to raise these guys. And then, oh, so here's a little video. <laughs> Isn't that the cutest? Yeah, so it takes a lot of time and effort and um, staff and volunteers and interns to, to run this rescue group. And so um, this, uh, this sloth, Reggie, is thanking you here. I think he's eating some ficus leaves there, which is um, one of their favorite uh, foods. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you I am not a sloth biologist, but I'm just a new fan, probably the newest fan of sloths. And so that's why we're doing this workshop today. Okay, and so then, um, so once they rescue and heal the sloths, they take them um, to their uh, rewilding or release center to uh, get them used to uh, nature again. Um, in fact, some of them haven't even spent much time in nature because they've lived in cities. <laughs> so um, this is a video of one of the sloths that was uh, there and uh, at the rescue uh, release site. And then... And of course, their ultimate goal is to rewild them. 
And so here is a picture. I forgot the name of this one, but uh, I took this video a couple of weeks ago. And so this one's getting used to being wild um, at the release site. So there's a lot of steps um, that go into um, uh, taking in um, an animal that's been injured um, or has been kept as a pet and then healing it, raising it if it's a baby orphan and then getting it used to um, being in the wild and then actually releasing it. So again, I hope you um, do uh, donate to the Toucan Rescue Ranch. So let's get going now. Now, of course, there's lots of threats to sloths. Now I'm going to make this bigger. You don't have to see me anymore, except for my wonderful t-shirt that I got from the Rescue Ranch. You can get one of these too if you visit. It is open to the public. Uh, they're just about an hour from the um, capital city of San Jose, Costa Rica, and um, they're open, I think, uh, six days a week. So anyway, what are the threats to sloths? You might think that they just happily live up in the trees in the wilderness, um, but that's not necessarily true. So there's lots of threats and lots of reasons that sloths um, come into rescue centers. So, of course, habitat loss, um, forest fragmentation and deforestation, vehicle collisions when they come down from the trees, uh, attacks by dogs. Uh, they even get electrocuted on power lines and they get poached for the illegal pet trade. So they have a lot of things that, um, that uh, are damaging them. So here's a picture. Uh, I forgot the name of this one, but this little guy or gal, she got electrocuted and here's a scar on her face there and a scar on the belly. So often they um, are mistaking uh, power lines and power poles for trees, or they just need to use those to get to another tree because they can't live in one tree forever and they get electrocuted. But the uh, Toucan Rescue Ranch uh, has a really good um, way to take care of them and, and um, a lot of success with that. Uh, of course, another threat is uh, forest fires with climate change and uh, fires uh, set um, on purpose to uh, clear land for agriculture and for farming and ranching and then clear cutting um, the forest for its trees. And then, of course, a lot of plantations um, take away uh, land that would nor normally be sloth habitat. So uh, pineapples and bananas and coconut and all that kind of stuff. Okay, now one threat that is natural <laughs> that they live with and have evolved with are jaguars and harpy eagles. Um, and so this is a, a, a picture of, of a harpy eagle actually being um, attacked by a three-toed sloth, which is time to protect itself. So um, sloths do have ways to protect themselves with these really big claws. But anyway, so very few natural predators, um, but those are one of the threats that they face. Okay, so let's start learning some more about sloths, and then we will sketch our sloths. How does that sound? Now, I don't see anybody in the chat box saying hi yet. Please say hi over in the chat box. Tell us where you're from and tell us if you've ever seen a sloth and maybe if you know what species it is. Okay, so a lot of people think of sloths kind of like they think of, um, you know, red-eyed tree frogs or toucans. They might just think of them um, as a cartoon. This isn't something that's really real, right? <laughs> and so uh, they're very popular um, in cartoons and advertising and art. Uh, and so, you know, we want to emphasize that just like with toucans and red-eyed tree frogs, they are real in the wild um, and they do have real lives and also real threats to their existence. So um, I did want to mention this excellent um, children's educational book that is written by two folks that I just happen to know. It's called Where the Wild Sloths Roam, and it's super cute. Nice story um, uh, written by uh, Denise Gillen, uh, who I met in Costa Rica recently, and illustrated by a colleague um, friend of mine who's a professional illustrator, Mindy Lightype. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that really cute book. Okay, so I wanted to um, show you Helga and demonstrating how sloths move because you may never have seen a sloth. <laughs> they are. Um, now, this is uh, Helga and she's at the release site. 
And here's a cute little video of her. So the most famous thing, of course, about sloths is how slow they are. In fact, David Attenborough pronounces them sloth, <laughs> just like he pronounces zebra, zebra. I love that. So, um, you know, they are slow, slow sloths. <laughs> and so they do, though, um, move a little bit faster than you might uh, imagine. They can move around up to 40 yards a day, I read. <laughs> and um, they, they can move a little faster than you think. So this is Helga, who's pretty much been rewilded, but uh, comes and visits uh, once in a while. And she's just showing her climbing skills there. Now, um, this is a very rare lifestyle that sloths have. It's a very rare niche called um, arbol arboreal folivores. Arboreal meaning tree dwelling and folivores meaning they eat leaves. So um, that's not a very efficient lifestyle and not very many mammals have learned how to do that. Um, not even very many uh, birds, like in the neotropics, we have the Watson, which is a bird that specializes in leaves. Um, but there aren't very many um, arboreal folivores because uh, leaves are very hard to digest. They have very little energy or calories. And an animal needs a really big gut so um, because it's hard to digest. In fact, it takes about a month for a single leaf to go through a sloth's digestive um, tract. So really only a few things um, like uh, pandas, koala bears, and a few monkeys like howler monkeys and lemurs um, are arboreal uh, folivores. And there aren't even that many ground-dwelling folivores. Those include things like elephants and okapis. Um, so it's not a really uh, common lifestyle. So we need to really respect these guys for what they do. Okay, so where do sloths live? So sloths are... Um, only in the neotropics, we call them, the uh, tropical rainforests of Central and South America. And there are six species. Uh, and so some of them are um, uh, farther north here, um, like the Hoffman's two-toed sloth. And some of them are a little bit farther south. So it just depends on what species. And uh, here's um, the banknotes of Costa Rica. So, of course, they live in Costa Rica, like where the Toucan Rescue Ranch is. And um, uh, I just love the currency of the um, of Costa Rican uh, money. Uh, and they really love their sloth. So they've got pictures of the three-toed sloth here on two different kinds of banknotes. Isn't that cool? Anyway, so what kind of habitats do they live in? Because there's a lot of different habitats um, from from sea level to um, the Paramo in the Andes. Uh, but these guys generally live lower elevation, especially where the Cecropia trees are, which is one of their favorite trees to um, dine on and to live in. So, um, so kind of here is setting the stage for where they live, the tropical rainforest going down from the lowland rainforest at sea um, level to a little mid-elevation, not quite cloud forests, I don't believe, but kind of mid-elevational forests. Uh, here's a, a look upward just to give you an idea. Um, so when you're uh, in a forest, of course, you'd have to look up to see a sloth and that's where they'd be. And here's a little video I want to show you pretending that you're a sloth and you're climbing up that big, big tree. It's going to take you forever to get up there. But look at that healthy habitat up there once you get up there. And this video was taken at the Toucan Rescue Ranch's release site. So you can see just how healthy that habitat is for them. So again, setting the stage for where sloths live, many animals share their arboreal rainforest uh, habitats. So we've got various uh, primates and lots of birds, again, like these cartoonish uh, red-eyed tree frogs and toucans. So you can imagine who shares their home with them. And um, But sloths are very ancient. Now, they evolved in um, South America 
And there were many, many species in several families. Uh, and ice age sloths during the Pleistocene and before were as big as elephants, some of those species. So here's a rearticulated skeleton. And um, so many of them went extinct during the ice ages over 10,000 years ago, like a lot of the um, large mammals. And we're, we're not sure, the scientists don't quite know if it was climate change or if it was hunting by um, the humans that were newly populating um, a Northern and Central and South America. But anyway, they went extinct. And the ones that um, these giant ground sloths um, their, some of their, um, relatives eventually adapted to living in trees and becoming much, much smaller. And of course, when they're in the trees, they rest and sleep up to 20 hours a day. <laughs> so that's another reason they might be called slow sloths, right? It takes a lot of energy to digest those meals. Okay. And, um, they're, um, they're not quite nocturnal. Um, they can be, um, awake or taking little cat naps or slow snaps, uh, any time of the day or night. So, um, they do kind of need to eat a little bit all day, um, to keep their energy up because there's not a lot of calories again in leaves and they're quite, um, challenging to digest. So, um, they like a lot of different species of trees. Um, like I, one I said was, uh, Cecropias, um, but there's many species. Um, they also uh, eat fruits and seed pods, and um, some sloths eat a little bit of animal protein too, some kind of insects and arthropods. <laughs> and so here's a couple pictures from the Toucan Rescue Ranch. They also feed them um, hibiscus flowers, which is just the most adorable thing to watch. Um, and I'm not sure um, how many um, flower petals they eat in the wild, what species of flowers, but they probably do. They have a quite wide diet. Um, okay. And um, so they are actually surprisingly good swimmers too. So they can not only uh, climb, uh, but they can swim and they can even crawl along the ground once in a while if they need to um uh, move to a different tree um, or a different habitat to get fresh food, or if they're finding and looking for a mate. So sloths have super unique anatomy, uh, and it's um, it's partly based on their lifestyle of hanging upside down in the trees. There aren't very many other animals that can do this for very long. Uh, even you, when you uh, try to hang on a pole and do a pull-up, that's quite hard for you, right? So um, they have really interesting um, anatomy to help them be able to hang. Of course, they have these, um, these wrists and these really long claws, and they have special um, ligaments and uh, muscles to help them hang kind of without thinking about it. Um, just like a bird can lock their feet onto a branch and sort of fall asleep and not think about holding, um, the sloth can do the same thing. Uh, they also have more um, pairs of ribs than any other mammal, 23 pairs. So um, they're really unique. <laughs> so a lot of people think they're kind of um, kind of plain and boring, but the more you learn about them, the more exciting they are. Um, now, uh, so they have fingers and toes, and there's a misnomer that um, many people call sloths like the three-toed sloth or the three thing, uh, three uh, two-toed sloth, um, but they all have um, three toes. Sometimes their palms are furred, and sometimes they're not, depending on the species. So this is one of the um, two-toed sloths, um, but I mean we're looking at its foot, so it's got three. Um, and it's got a bear palm. Okay, so anyway, all species of sloths have three toes. You can see that here, three toes with three long claws. Um, so again, that's a misnomer. It's better to name them three-fingered or two-fingered because um, one family has two-fingered, like the Hoffman's um, two-fingered sloth in Costa Rica, and you can see a close-up of that right here. So basically two fingers with two long um, digits or claws. And the other family um, has three fingers. So both three on the back legs and the four legs. You can see that really well here. 
uh, speaking of their anatomy, they look a little bit different inside their mouths too that relate to what they eat. And these are actually illustrations I created while I was at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Um, so um, they differ just a little bit. Now, most members of this um, larger uh, group um, uh, called Xenarthra, which includes uh, armadillos and anteaters, which I've taught um, some of you about before, um, that whole um, super order um, has very simplified teeth or even no teeth, like if you're an anteater. So, um, but they do differ a little bit. The three-fingered sloth has um, four pairs of teeth in the lower jaw here that are kind of more equal, whereas the two-fingered sloth, they have um, longer um, ones up front that kind of look like canines. And that's related to their diet, um, partly, we think, because two-fingered sloths can eat a wider range of foods um, like um, insect protein. Um, so that might be, relate. <laughs> Another really unique thing about sloths is they have this four-chambered stomach. And this is an illustration, uh, again, I created. Their stomach is huge um, inside their body for, again, it's kind of like a cow. If you're eating low-calorie um, vegetation like grass or leaves, in the case of sloths, it's going to take a lot of them to eat. You know, you, it's not like you're eating uh, cheese <laughs> that has tons of calories. So you have to eat a lot and you have to digest it kind of like a cow. So they have really unique um, digestion and uh, interesting um, flora in there, bacterial um, and um, fungal flora to help them digest. And here is a picture, speaking of digestion, is um, it takes about a month for a single leaf to go through their body. And when they go to the bathroom, they always come down to the ground and they only do that once a week. And when they do that, they can release about 30% of their body weight at once. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if we could lose that much weight in one sitting? <laughs> and I actually saw a sloth doing this um, at the release site. This isn't my picture, um, but uh, I did see that. And they crawl down very slowly and then they um, use the restroom <laughs> at the base of their tree, um, kind of cover it up a little bit, and then they crawl back up. And uh, this is a dangerous activity for them to do because then they are uh, more susceptible to being eaten by a jaguar or being attacked by non-native dogs or um, collected, um, stolen or kidnapped by people who want to keep them in the illegal pet trade. So it's a really dangerous thing. But um, uh, scientists aren't quite sure why they come to the ground to use the restroom. There are a few um, different theories from um, the concept of you are um, putting a little uh, nutrient in the tree that you live in, or maybe you're uh, leaving some scent in that uh, manure uh, for a potential mate, um, or it's a good place for the um, their symbiotic moths um, to lay their eggs. Um, so we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. So lots of different reasons. Okay, so um, yeah, the unique ecosystem on the fur of the sloths. <laughs> so we'll talk about the, um, the, the uh, moth in a sec, but the first thing you can really notice about a wild sloth is um, the greenest, greenish tinge to their fur. And so um, this algae helps hide the sloth from predators. And some scientists even think that they might uh, eat the algae once in a while, kind of scrape it off with their um, long claws and eat some of it. But um, um, so, so it's kind of a, a symbiotic association or a commensal association, which means when um, two species live together and they may not harm each other, but they may not hurt each other either. So that might be the case of the algae, but um, it does certainly give the algae a place to live that's sunnier than on the ground. And it helps the um, sloth be more camouflaged in the trees. And when the sloth um, has its lifestyle of moving so slowly that um, that paired with the green color is going to help camouflage it from the jaguars and especially in the trees from the harpy eagles. So moving slow and being green um, helps you. 
And so the moths, they definitely have a commensal or even more specifically symbiotic association um, with the sloths. And so this is a picture of one. There are several species of these moths. Um, they're in the family uh, called snout moths. <laughs> and so um, do I have another picture here? No, I don't have another picture, but um, they can be, they can, I read that um, scientists have found up to 120 of these uh, moths on one sloth. And it seems that three fingered sloths might harbor more of these. So what happens is the moths complete their life cycle on the sloth. <laughs> so um, they find protection by living in the sloth's fur and they might eat some of the sloth's um, skin or secretions or droppings um, or the, even the algae. And then what happens is when the sloth comes down to the ground to use the restroom like this, um, then the, the female uh, moth jumps off and she lays her eggs in that fresh manure. And then the eggs hatch and uh, eat the manure as larvae. And then when they become adults, the moth um, finds another sloth to live in. So it's just amazing. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Um, yeah, and so I read that several moth species might live on one sloth. <laughs> so moths and their sloths, very interesting. Okay. Um, another unique thing about sloths is their fur grows in the opposite direction of other mammals. So like if you were going to, if you imagine like petting your dog, you know, you'd pet the head and you'd go down the back and the fur is kind of going towards the back and down towards the belly, right? Um, well, these guys um, is going the opposite direction. So it's, it's laying towards the, um, towards their back here. So that helps to, um, to shed water, they think, because of course they live in a very wet environment. Okay, so um, folks in the chat box, I don't see anybody saying hi in the chat box. I hope the chat box is working because it usually, usually does. And I usually see people. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll try to answer them. Or if um, one of our um, friends from the Toucan Rescue Ranch uh, comes on, um, maybe they can, um, maybe they can uh, come on and answer a question too. So I really don't know if anybody is even watching right now because I haven't seen anybody in the chat box. So please just say hello in the chat box so I do know I'm still live. Okay, so a little bit about family life. So sloths are pretty solitary. Um, they usually just hang out by themselves and uh, they only come together to mate. And when the male uh, scents, um, smells, you know, the female scent, he will climb up a tree and find her and they will mate. It's a pretty um, quick affair. And then she will give birth um, after a gestation period. And um, so she gives birth right in the um, trees. And then the um, baby um, has to be able to hang on just like babies hang on to their uh, anteater mothers and pangolin mothers. <laughs> um, they hang on to their back and climb around and um, nurse. Uh, and then within a week or so, they're already curious about what the mom is eating and is, are starting to eat their own leaves too. Uh, here's another really cute picture of um, the three-toed or three-fingered sloth and this um, baby. Okay, so a little bit of classification. I did mention before that they're in this super order called Zine Arthra. And that's a, um, a Latin word meaning strange um, articulations because this order, which includes um, just 31 species of sloths, armadillos, and ant eaters, uh, they have a really um, interesting joints. And so it's thought that their common ancestor millions of years ago was a subterranean insect eater that would use those big claws that we see in all of them, um, like this uh, tamandua here that I taught some of you guys about last week, and the armadillo. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the um, tamandua, um, anteater, and armadillos, you can go to my main Crowdcast page. Um, you can remind me about that later. 
and I'll show you the links to those. And again, if you donate today at least $25 to support the Toucan Rescue Ranch and you forward your um, receipt to me, I will give you free access to my mammal sketching course that teaches you all about these guys as well. And so, um, so this group, um, they're united by the fact that they have really um, interesting joints. Um, they're thought to be the most primitive, primitive of the placental mammals. Uh, they have single color vision, very unique teeth, or even no teeth, like in some of the ant eaters. Uh, really interesting uh, reproductive structures and the lowest metabolism of any um, of the um, of the mammals. And so moving on to the two different groups, a lot of people think sloths are sloths and they're all the same, but they're actually in two different families that aren't very closely related. They diverged millions of years ago. Um, in fact, I read it was about 28 million years ago that they diverged. So the three-fingered sloths are called Bradypodidae. There's four species of those. And um, so they have this really cute raccoon-like mask. They have an even slower and lower metabolism because they do exclusively um, eat leaves, no animal protein. They have these three um, claws on their three fingers in the front and their um, palms are furred. They have longer um, arms in relation to, to the two-fingered sloths. And they do have a short tail. So here's their little cute little tail here that you can see. So their tail is um, it's longer than the uh, two-fingered. And so here's an image my friend took, uh, Sam Woods, who uh, works with Tropical Birding Tours. He's taken me on tours in Ecuador, a wonderful guide, uh, great photographer. And he took this picture of this um, three-fingered uh, sloth in Panama. So it's showing this little tiny short tail that you can see on the three-fingered sloths. And the three fingers have extra neck bones that allow them to turn their head 270 degrees. It's almost like they're an owl. So they can turn their head all the way and uh, it's easier for them to uh, look for predators and to uh, grab a nearby leaf without moving the rest of their body. And you can see just how long those front limbs are, which is longer than the two fingers. And um, so you see that black mask here. And they also have this really interesting um, stripe on the black that's different than the two fingers. Just a couple more uh, images of them. Again, they've got that three fingers on the front, but remember they got three on the back too. All sloths have three toes. This is one itching itself. So uh, isn't it wonderful to have those long claws? You can itch uh, any place really good. And you probably are really itchy if you're sloth because you have all that algae. You have those symbiotic uh, moths. Um, and you even have things like beetles and mites and, and fungi, all kinds of stuff. So I can imagine you'd be really itchy and it would be great to have those nice long claws. Okay, and in um, there are some species of endangered sloths, and one of them in this family is the pygmy three-fingered sloth that only lives um, on an island off Panama. And uh, this is a historic uh, drawing. Uh, I couldn't find a real picture of one of them, but here's a historic drawing that was drawn in the 1800s by early explorers. They thought sloths were um, really uh, stupid and slow. And of course, um, sloths were named after one of the um, Christian seven deadly slin sins. <laughs> that is a sin to be sloth-like. So anyway, this historic picture. Okay, then there is the other family, the Coloiopodidae <laughs> with two-fingered sloths. And there's just two species of those guys. And here uh, Helga is demonstrating those guys. So again, they have two fingers on the front um, and their palms are bare, kind of like our palms. So it's a little bit um, different look to it. They have a longer kind of pig-like snout, um, which is super cute. Um, and it's a, a bear, bear skin on there. Um, their fur is a little bit different color. Instead of being more gray and black, it's more creamier to brown or burnt sienna, as an artist would say. They have no tail 
and their diet is a bit wider with um, some animal protein. Okay, so like I was showing you before, I illustrated the lower jaw with those longer teeth. And you can see here, um, this, I forgot who this is, Milo, Millie, I can't remember who this is. Um, but this is one of the sloths at the rescue ranch, and you can see these teeth and that really cute, hairless pig-like snout. Okay, just a moment. So um, I, there is a question in the question box where it says, ask a question. Um, and, um, oh, Susan said, lots of comments in the chat box here. Oh, interesting. Maybe my, maybe I'm having a little bit of an issue. I'm sorry if I can't see your comments in the chat box. They're not showing up on my computer, which is the first time that's ever happened. I've done about 150 of these live online workshops. So, but I so if you have a, a really important question, you could probably put it in the section here um, below the slideshow that says, ask a question, because that seems to work. Um, so somebody did say, did you use charcoal or colored pencils for the drawings of their jaw bones? Um, and so this is um, a really unique um unique um, technique that I use and I've taught a lot. And again, if you if you are in, um, if you join my mammal course, uh, you'll see lots of demonstrations I've done in this technique. It's called the carbon dust technique. And it's super cool. It's a, a historic technique that was developed by a 19th century medical illustrator to make very um, re realistic three-dimensional drawings. So basically what you're doing is you're painting, dry painting with charcoal dust. Anyway, so again, if you join... Um, if you um, donate $25 or more to the Toucan Rescue Ranch today and you send that receipt to me uh, at hello at christineelder.com, then I will give you free access to that course, which is actually a $125 value course. Okay, there's just a couple more really cute pictures of the two-fingered sloths really um, showing close up those two fingers on the front and the adorable pig-like snout. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'm really sorry if I can't see your comments. It's, this is the first time this has ever happened to me where I can't see comments. I only see the very first comments that says, thank you for hosting this event by Coco. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so here's some sloths eating leaves. Again, they eat a lot of different species. And just another cute picture of a two fingered sloth. Okay, so now we want to get moving on because we want to start drawing our sloths. And I know some of you may be new here. Um, and so I have this kind of concept called Six steps, steps to Sketching Success. And so this demonstrates um, a sea lion being sketched, but it's the same whether you're drawing uh, sloths or sea lions or anything that you wanna kind of think about these six ideas while you're drawing something to help you with their correct proportions. Um, so you wanna think about blocking in your basic shapes, circles, rectangles, squares, ovals. You wanna think about negative shapes. That's like these black shapes here between the um, sea, sorry, the sea lion's belly and flipper. You want to think about angles, like say to yourself, is that a um, 120 degree angle between my neck and my back of my sea lion? Or is it uh, less than 90 degrees, like down here on the flipper? Uh, you want to think about alignments, basically what structures are aligned with other structures. So in this case, uh, like the sea lion's snout is lined up with its uh, chest. Um, you also want to think about relative proportions. So when you're blocking in those first shapes, thinking about, you know, how big is that head compared to the body or how long is the flipper compared to the tail? And then the concept of flow lines or how your, your pencil um, is flowing over the animal, helping to kind of imagine that shape. 
And so here is the um, sloth. We're going to be drawing this Hoffman's two-fingered sloth. So just giving you an idea here. Um, the more you look at something and understand its anatomy and behavior, um, the faster and with more confidence you're going to be sketching. Okay. And so here we would block in um, the basic uh, proportions. So um, we would look at negative shapes, like the shape um, between the two front arms and this nice triangular shape between the front arms and the legs. Um, we would look at uh, angles, like we have sort of like a little bit more than a 90 degree angle here um, and uh, 120 degree angle here maybe. Thinking about what's aligned, so what kind of things are parallel? So like the two front um, arms are pretty parallel to each other. Um, the eyes are in a, in a same line, that kind of thing. And then it helps to look at something right side up. So um, I encourage if you have printed out the resources, which I sent you earlier, um, hopefully almost all of you should have gotten those because there's only a few people that have uh, signed up after I sent that out. Um, but I always suggest you turn um, your picture upside down to look at it. And uh, since sloths are often upside down, it's a little bit hard to make heads or tails <laughs> um, of them. And so here uh, in my video demonstration, I'll show you in a minute, um, you can kind of look at how the eyes are aligned, the nose is in the middle, but in this case, um, the sloth is turning its head a little bit. And so the snout here is a little bit closer to this eye than this eye, but it's really subtle. Um, and then they have the two nostrils and look at how shiny that snout is. Um, so that's a bit different than the three fingered sloths, which have a different kind of face, but their snout is really um, wet here. Maybe it's been raining and you can see all that shininess there. All right. And then, so again, when you're drawing, envision these basic shapes. So here I just quickly um, would, when I would start a sketch like that, just like Here's a couple that I had just started and you can see I'm just thinking about those basic shapes and I was drawing very lightly first and then I've darkened these up a little bit, but these are just examples of starting to think about those basic shapes. Okay. And then, so, and then envisioning the bones and joints under the fur. So if you remember that um, we looked at those skeletons and so think about that because it's pretty difficult when you've got a really furry mammal to imagine um, that there's actually the skeleton and there's angles underneath. You know, just like our body, since we don't have fur, if you were drawing me, you could more easily see the angle of my, of my elbow and the angles of my wrists, right? Uh, but for some um, animals that are uh, very... Um, thickly covered in fur, like sloths, it's kind of hard to imagine, but it really helps because you don't want to over round any particular part. So like here is the wrist. Um, there's a little angle there. There's an angle back here and this is the elbow, just like the elbow I just showed you on my own body. And there's quite um, an obvious angle there. And then here, this is the, um, this is the, the angle of the knee. So it's really subtle, but if you um, think about that skeleton underneath, it will really help you. Okay. And so here I've just circled those same parts on this skeleton for you to think about that as we're drawing the wrist, the ankle, the elbow, and the knee. So the more you kind of envision that while you're drawing, the easier it will be. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to sketching our two-fingered sloth, okay? So if you have your um, sketching cheat sheet, that's great, but if you don't, that's okay, because I'm gonna be showing a picture as well as a close-up of the face when we're drawing. So you can always download those references later. Um, and then, you know, a, a, a sketchbook or just a piece of paper, and then any kind of um, pencils you may like. All righty, so we're gonna get started. Um, don't worry if you've never sketched before. 
um, just try. Um, anytime you do something the first time, it's going to be a challenge and you're not expected to do it perfectly like riding a bike, right? So it just takes practice. And I encourage you to stay as light and loose as you can on the paper. And I'm going to be doing that um, as well, right? And so like when I sketch, I start super lightly where you can barely see it. So no matter what kind of medium you have, even if it's um, even if it's a ballpoint pen like this, you can start super lightly and then press harder and harder and harder and harder. OK, so we want to really start very lightly without pushing down at all on the paper because I'm not really going to do any erasing. Um, and. Uh, even though sloths are a very slow moving animal and they would, um, <laughs> you would be able to um, have plenty of time to erase drawing a sloth compared to say a hummingbird. Um, I'm not gonna do much erasing, okay? So anyway, we've looked at this sloth enough, but usually what I do is I kind of just trace it with my hand like I was and then think about where the branches that it's hanging from. So I'm going to draw sort of like just a very, very light horizontal line first that's going to show where my branch is going to be and a little bit of the trunk. <laughs> Jacqueline's gotten a head start. Mary Ellen's ready. Susan's following along. Tanya and, um, and Susan Wilson is using charcoals. Wow, very cool. Okay, so I'm just kind of blocking in the trunk and the branch first, but still staying super, super light. So I know you might not be able to see this really well, but I don't want you to necessarily just copy me, but just notice how lightly I'm drawing so that I don't feel like I'm really getting um, married to any one line yet, that I'm still um, able to just... Put it really lightly and of course the sloth's right limbs will be overlapping this branch so we don't want to make it too dark anyway because we want the limbs to overlap so now that we've got the branch and the trunk we're going to start blocking in the sloth and i'm just noticing that it's kind of a big rectangle this sloth and so I'm just kind of blocking in a really um, loose, light rectangle. So you see the sloth comes almost down to the bottom of the paper there. And its back is kind of arched over to the head. And this is the very lightest line you can possibly make with your pencil, okay? So I just blocked that in. Now I'm going to start drawing the um, particular parts. And just noticing the main body. So just a big, very, very light oval again, so that you can feel like you can erase it later, but we're not doing any erasing right now. I just made a very light oval for the body. And now I'm just blocking in where the legs would be, just very light lines. It's just giving me a little bit of a, a foundation, just like when you're building a house and you're getting started on the foundation, okay? So when you build a house, you would uh, pour a concrete foundation first, and then you would build the walls on top of that. And so at this stage, that's what I've done. I know, again, you can't see it really too well, but I want you to just to go, um, you know, following my words. So now I'm going to start doing the particular parts. So I'm blocking in where the face, the head is. So there's the, the whole uh, light colored head. It's sort of an oval. It's kind of the, yeah, the lightest part of the head that includes the eyes and the snout. So I'm drawing that little oval. And then I'll be making a larger oval around that that sort of includes the 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 chin and the neck and you see how i'm doing some measurements so noticing how tall and wide it is 
So no details yet, just blocking in the whole area of the head. And then noticing that the left arm comes up from the edge of the head there. So just a really light, uh, rec narrow rectangle for the, the sloth's left front leg. And just noticing where it comes into the face there. And there's that little bare palm that just the two-fingered family has. The three-fingered have a furry palm. And then I'm showing those two fingers there. Well, actually the claws that are wrapped around the branch. So you haven't sketched much with me before. Um, you might just want to watch if you're feeling like you're getting a little bit behind because I don't want to keep you here all day. And you can always watch the replay and stop it whenever you want um, to catch up. But I really suggest if this feels like going too fast, um, you might just watch this me going around. So now I'm going around the forearm and you can see that I'm noticing where that elbow um, that wrist is right there coming down to the, the neck area of the sloth. So again, we can imagine we see those, those wrists and coming down to that elbow. So even though it might look kind of subtle to you, double checking where that elbow is, that that is an angle. So don't over round that too much. You definitely want to show that. There are those elbow joints underneath, and it's about at the same height as the head there. So you can see I'm always looking back and forth at my um, photograph um, to make sure I'm draw trying to draw what I see and not from my imagination. Now the um, doing the neck that's uh, coming down to the bottom of the paper and kind of the rest of that cheek and neck area. And then that shoulder area, the shoulder blade area, and then the belly. The belly is a little higher than the head. Double checking where that belly is. And then the width of the whole belly where, remember, all those ribs are. They have more ribs than any other animal. And then that angle there of the hip. And the uh, that is the knee, I'm sorry. And the knee and the elbow you see are quite close together. So just double checking that you see that. They can, they're almost touching, just like a human can touch their elbow to their knee. And then that knee wraps around with the hip area. It's kind of a big oval there. And of course, the bottom of the sloth is going to be a little fuzzy from all that fur hanging down. We'll add those details later. But we first just want to block in the whole shape of the sloth before we start adding details of the fur. So now the sloth's back right leg, and it's kind of hidden behind that trunk a bit. So I thought I'd just firm up that line of the trunk to make it really obvious that that um, back limb is going to be hidden just a little bit behind that trunk. Double checking the width of my limb there, and then ankle coming down to the knee and the hip. Now they're the sloth's left rear leg. You don't see much of that and it touches that front right, right? So it visually touches and it makes a little triangle, nice negative shape in there. So noticing that triangle between the, um, the right forelimb and the left rear limb. And then I'm going to firm up the firm up the branch a bit so that I can wrap that leg around the back 
and its toes are coming kind of towards us. So quite flexible, those, those long claws um, can wrap around kind of going forward or back. Now just firmed up that branch. My branch is probably a little bit narrow. So now what I'm doing is I'm flipping it over <laughs> just so we can check our proportions and draw the head right side up a bit. Sometimes it really helps to see something upside down and it really helps you to see your proportions. I'm just gonna freeze this hair just for a moment. Again, I don't know if there's any more um, people in the chat box. Maybe you're busy drawing or catching up. The last chat I saw was from Susan Wilson mentioning using charcoals. So, um, so anyway, um, just sometimes it's great to be able to flip your drawing upside down. And especially with an animal that lives upside down, it helps you a little bit to see and draw the face. But at this point, um, I will often do this so that I can kind of check my proportions because it helps you to switch into your right brain so that you can really see um, things a little bit better. So looking back and forth between your beginning sketch um, and your uh, subject and kind of looking um, at different, uh, you know, angles and alignments and proportions uh, and that kind of thing. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to draw this way for a little while so that we can just practice since again, an animal that's upside down is a little bit disorienting visually. Oh, Rhea, thanks for mentioning, uh, just watching and listening. Great. So that bare palm there, of the two fingered sloths, it's not furry, it's bare. And so I'm just getting a little bit more details and noticing, starting to add the, the kind of soft, fuzzy fur. So we're moving from the very light um, outline to more of a um, adding the fuzzy fur part, making it more realistic. Now that shoulder, and again, noticing that there's an elbow right there that I'm drawing. So... Make sure to make that an angle. And just as you're doing this, noticing the direction of the fur. Again, sloths have fur that's oriented in the opposite direction. Now that back limb, again, you can see that bare palm. And the toes, you can only see a couple of the toes, but remember all sloths have three toes. This family has two fingers. And the three fingered sloth has three. <laughs> anyway, so now I'm just trying to um, make the outline a little bit fuzzier to uh, show that fur. And again, just noticing very Oh yeah, Kirsten, thank you. Don't get too sidetracked by the donation, but make sure to do that later, please. Okay, and then the back. I noticed that the back is a little bit straighter line in this sloth, and then kind of the area of the hip and the belly. I'm gonna freeze that a sec. <laughs> I noticed the area of the um the 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 back and the hip here have a little bit fuzzier fur. But, you know, again, just like any kind of um, individual mammal, their fur is going to look really different depending on, you know, how, um, if they're wet or dry or, or whatever. Yeah, Joji says it really helps to draw upside down. You can see the proportions and angles much better. Yes, it helps you to switch to your right brain. Um, so anyway, let's now move on to drawing this adorable face of the Hoffman's two-fingered sloth. So it just has some really fuzzy fur on the neck and kind of the forehead. So the fur outline can be a little bit more um, unique, but the, the face needs to be a little bit particular. So again, you're noticing that this sloth is looking a little bit to our right. 
And so um, the snout is going to be a little bit more to the right, not directly between the two eyes. So I'm just trying to place the, um, the snout first, like a very kind of light squarish rectangle. <laughs> And then angles there, noticing that the um, the eye, the right eye is right above the edge of the snout, whereas the left eye is a little bit farther to the left. I'm not sure if I really depicted that right. Maybe I fixed it later. I can't remember. And just notice the difference between the eye and then also the brown um, coloration of the skin and fur around the eyes that makes their eyes look bigger, which probably makes them a little bit look a little bit scarier to predators, right? <laughs> and then noticing the two nostrils, sort of like circles, but not exactly. And then I see a little bit of the lower lip of the mouth. Okay, so now I'm turning it right side upside down again, <laughs> looking again to see what we've done with the head. So if you're drawing this a little bit bigger, it would probably be a bit easier for you to depict the fact that the head is turning a bit to um, um, the sloth's left. So anyway, as you're drawing, always continue to look back and forth. Sorry, my mouse keeps getting in the way. There we go. So anyway, at this size, it's a little bit hard to get all that detail in there the correct way, but... Now I'm pushing down a little bit harder on the paper. So that's why my camera is moving a bit. Sorry there. But I'm trying to show the, the more darker coloration of the snout and around the eyes, which again serves to uh, make the eyes look bigger. And so maybe makes the animal look a little bit more intimidating to a would-be predator. We all, always... We always have to guess, really, as scientists. We usually can't prove why something is a certain way on a plant or animal. We can just imagine what its um, adaptive effects would be. All right, so I'm kind of looking at the whole body again. We're going to go back and start to, to firm up now. But I'm not necessarily just tracing the lines I already had. I'm still continuing to look. So we've got the two fingers on the front limb. And my line is pretty firm um, until I get closer to the body where the fur gets longer and longer. And there's the bare pad of the palm. The forearm, a little fuzzy there. Sharpening my pencil. <laughs> and the fur around the face is pretty short. And then it gets longer when you get towards the back of the neck. And you might want to delineate that kind of lighter color of the front of the face from the darker color. We're not really adding color today. We're just trying to mainly get the silhouette or the external shape and a little bit of a suggestion of the fur, but not too much of really the color patterns or the shadowing. We don't have time to do an entire drawing class today.
Oh, fun. Joji, maybe you can share your, your sketches later when we're done here. We got a, about, I don't know, maybe 10 more minutes here finishing this drawing, and then we'll invite people up on stage. And you can share your sketches or ask any questions. Again, I'm not a, a sloth biologist, but I'm just uh, learned a bit about sloths while I was volunteering at the rescue ranch and wanted to do today's activity as a fundraiser. So again, I encourage you to donate to the Toucan Rescue Ranch. And when you do, you donate $25 or more and send me your receipt. I'll give you that other mammal class. I think I made him a little bit too skinny, but that's okay. Maybe he or she um, just went to the bathroom. Because <laughs> remember, these guys, their belly can get huge. Um, and then when they go to the um, bathroom at the base of the tree, they can lose a third of their body weight. And so maybe this is, um, maybe my drawing is one that has just gone to the bathroom and is a little bit skinnier than the one in the photo. So like I said, the more you know about an animal's anatomy and their behavior, the more you know, um, you know, how exact that you um, would need to make your drawing to still have it um, be biologically accurate. So just doing a little bit of shading, kind of putting that back left limb into the shadow. Part of that color is from shadow. Part of that might be just coloration of the fur because you can see the fur does have a little bit different color. So I'm just now have holding my pencil on its side. So I have a little bit more uh, of the, um, the pencil there attached touching the paper and I'm pressing down a little bit harder. So you can see like how different the color is between the arm and the cheek there. But um, we're just starting to observe that part. Don't have time. I hope you can um, keep working on your sketch and you can either send it to me at hello at christineelder.com or you can put it over on our Facebook page. I have a, a Facebook group just for my online students to um, share their sketches and for me to tell folks about upcoming events. Yeah, Jacqueline said, you'd love to know more about the muscle structure of the sloths. They must have strong muscles. Where well, you know, no, that's an interesting thing you mentioned because I did read that sloths um, have a lot lower muscle mass than a lot of other mammals um, because they don't have to actually support their whole body in an upright position. They're just hanging there. And so a lot of their unique structures are... Um, based um, on their tendons and ligaments that allow them to hang. Um, but um, so they, you know, they can hang very strongly because those uh, claws can hook around the branches, but I'm not sure actually like how strong they are if they were in a, in a, um, um, an arm wrestling competition. But I did read that they, um, they have about 30% less muscle mass than um, another mammal that it would be kind of their similar size. Like, yeah, like a raccoon or a Tyra or a Kawadi. So we're just continuing to, you know, look back and forth and just noticing the shades. Yeah, now I look at my my drawing of my face. It's not that accurate. <laughs> I should have spent more time drawing it upside, right side up because the eye is a little bit, the right eye is a little bit too high, isn't it? And too small. Well, you always notice those kind of things when you're looking at a drawing on a big screen like I have. I've got a monitor that's uh, two feet wide. So when I look at something up close, I can see all those um, problems that aren't as evident on my smaller sketch on the paper. <laughs> so 
So anyway, wherever you are in your drawing process, just keep working on it a bit. And um, if you're interested in coming up on screen and sharing your um, sketch or just asking any question live, that's always really fun for me because it gets a little bit um, awkward and lonely just looking at my uh, web camera here for an hour and a half <laughs> and not talking to any real people. So I'd love to have some real people join. Um, and the way you would do that is you would get over in the chat box and you would type the word share into the chat box. And I know a lot of you guys, I've seen your names and I've met you before and you've shared. So, um, but I know we have a lot of new members um, today watching us from the Toucan Rescue Ranch who maybe haven't gone live before. Maybe they're more shy. So I would hope one of um, our folks like Sue, thank you, would share and uh, kind of demonstrate it's not that scary to do that. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. I think I added a little bit more. I want to keep, I want to, I just was adding a little bit of pen marks. I think we got to keep going because I don't want to keep you too long. I'm just going a little bit ahead to just show you what I was doing. I'm just using a little sharper pencil and trying to work on that outline. And so I wanted to show you here. So my finished one, you see I added a lot more shadowing um, and a lot more edges. Now, this is not supposed to be like a biological illustration or a field guide drawing. This is something I would, um, about the level of drawing I would do if I was, you know, sketching in my, you know, sketchbook in the field. But um, so it's, it's still pretty uh, rough, but it's um, enough to get us um, learning about something. Because the one reason I really encourage people to draw is not necessarily to try to make a perfect, beautiful drawing. But the time spent drawing, like the last half hour, the whole time you're drawing something, you're thinking about its anatomy and its behavior and its color pattern and everything we learned about sloths. And so it kind of cements it in your mind, um, uh, learning more about the animal than you ever would have if you just look at it or uh, take a photo of it, right? So again, last, last time I want to tell you, Today, if you enjoyed today's workshop, um, even if you're already a member of one of my programs, I would really highly encourage you to donate to the Toucan Rescue Ranch um, and help them support sloths. They rescue about 100 sloths every year, um, and many of those are healed successfully and are released into the wilderness. And if they can't be released, they have permanent sanctuary at the ranch. And so it gets to be quite expensive to um, take care of all the food. <laughs> I know I spent a few days chopping food and they eat a lot, all those animals. Um, the macaws and toucans and parrots. They've got an armadillo, an anteater. They've got several wild cats as well as the sloths. So um, a, a high number of animals that need a really varied diet. And that can be really expensive, plus all the medical bills. And they've got uh, tours, uh, and usually the tours are, are pretty small. Um, so uh, there's just maybe five or maybe up to 10 people in the tour, and you get to um, go around and check out all the animals. Now, they also have virtual tours. So I encourage you to check out the website of the Toucan Rescue Ranch, and please donate to support their cause. Thanks for joining me today. Take care. Bye-bye.